final year of George Washington's first term as President of the United States of America, he considered retiring from public service and asked James Madison to help him prepare a valediction. When he decided that he would indeed run for a second term, the drafted document was set aside. The Electoral College went on to unanimously re-elect him. After four more years, Washington knew he did not have another term left in him. This time, however, he approached Alexander Hamilton to help him draft an updated statement to the American people, explaining his decisions against running for re-election and also to convey some parting words of advice to the citizens of a still young republic. Because three major founding fathers were involved, from one degree to another, this has led some scholars to debate how much of the final product was of Washington's own design, especially because of Hamilton's participation. Hamilton's wife, Eliza, claimed lots of things for her husband um, after his death, and I think spent the rest of a very long life uh, trying to um, furbish his reputation. The loyalty of Hamilton's wife, uh, Eliza, is an admirable thing, but uh, she's looking at her husband's work through rose-colored glasses. I think there's a whole cottage industry of historians that have emerged that are trying to deconstruct Washington's farewell address, trying to see who should get primary responsibility for it. Hamilton had been writing for Washington ever since the Revolution and had a very good sense of the way Washington liked to express his ideas. Hamilton's very good at writing in Washington's voice, but certainly the sentiment is Washington's. The ideas are, are Washington's. Washington's farewell address was an expression of what George Washington felt. Hamilton helped, there's no question about that. Hamilton serves in that editorial role, but it's not his ideas, it's not even really shaping the ideas, it's just the presentation of the ideas, making sure that it's kind of internally consistent, that it flows. But even in the end, there was something in the final weeks where, where Washington offered 175, 176 edits. When he had decided on the final version, he spent the weekend before it was printed going over the proofs himself, actually making changes, including grammatical. Washington was not about to put his name to anything in which he did not have full confidence. I think we should probably stay focused on the big picture, which is this speech reflects Washington's deepest held views about the country and the concerns he had about the country's future. The document was first published in David C. Claypool's American Daily Advertiser under the title, The Address of General Washington to the People of the United States on His Declining of the Presidency of the United States. It would subsequently be reprinted in newspapers across the nation and see itself reproduced in pamphlet form for mass distribution. Over the centuries, it has come to be known as the First President's Farewell Address. United States, 19th of September, 1796. Friends and fellow citizens, the period for a new election of a citizen to administer the executive government of the United States being not far distant, and the time actually arrived when your thoughts must be employed in designating the person who is to be clothed with that important trust, it appears to me proper, especially as it may conduce to a more distinct expression of the public voice that I should now apprise you of the resolution I have formed to decline being considered among the number of those out of whom a choice is to be made. I beg you, at the same time, to do me the justice to be assured that this resolution has not been taken without a strict regard to all the considerations appertaining to the relation which binds a dutiful citizen to his country, and that, in withdrawing the tender of service which silence in my situation might imply, I am influenced by no diminution of zeal for your future interest, no deficiency of grateful respect for your past kindness, but am supported by a full conviction that the step is compatible with both. Washington's decision not to run for a third term was both 
a matter of personal preference and of public policy. Uh, in fact, uh, whatever Washington did became a matter of public policy, whether he liked it or not. Washington recognizes that no one had his popularity, his credibility with the American public, with the entire country, but that the country was going to need to develop some kind of political leadership, some kind of political depth, uh, if you will, in order to survive. And so he felt like eight years was long enough. He wanted to have a peaceful transfer of power. He thought that was crucial. And he didn't want to die in office. He had been in public life for many, many years, was exhausted, was worn down by all the, the squabbling within his administration and within the political system. He was tired. Uh, he had done the work he set out to do in putting the Republic on a firm foundation. No question that he, he deserves enormous credit for that. No one knew what this new Republic was going to do. No one knew how this new Constitution was going to work out. But his decision to, to step down from power and to rotate the office effectively created um, a, a whole institution of presidential departures. And it took until 1940 for another American president not to uh, respect the tradition of, of two terms. The acceptance of and continuance hitherto in the office to which your suffrages have twice called me have been a uniform sacrifice of inclination to the opinion of duty and to a deference for what appeared to be your desire. I constantly hoped that it would have been much earlier in my power, consistently with motives which I was not at liberty to disregard, to return to that retirement from which I had been reluctantly drawn. The strength of my inclination to do this, previous to the last election, had even led to the preparation of an address to declare it to you. But mature reflection on the then perplexed and critical posture of our affairs with foreign nations, and the unanimous advice of persons entitled to my confidence, impelled me to abandon the idea. I rejoice that the state of your concerns, external as well as internal, no longer renders the pursuit of inclination incompatible with a sentiment of duty or propriety, and am persuaded whatever partiality may be retained for my services, that in the present circumstances of our country, you will not disapprove my determination to retire. I think Washington talking about serving as a sacrifice really reflects the culture of the time. You didn't run for office. You essentially took on that responsibility as part of your civic duty and a belief that your status, your wealth, your position, your education required of you to give back to your community. To state that you were an active candidate politically uh, was not really approved at that time. You were not supposed to aggressively go after governmental positions or the public limelight. It was unseemly. But Washington uh, took the presidency, I think, with some reluctance, um, I think realizing that it was going to be extraordinarily difficult. Washington could have had any office that he wanted. He could have had any amount of power that he wanted, but he didn't really want it. Washington uh, was seen by many Americans as a modern Cincinnatus. The old Roman general who left the plow, uh, defended his country against a foreign invader, and then went back to the plow, expecting no reward. So Washington was, was not dying for this job. I mean, he was considered the only one who was really of the stature for it. In fact, many people believe that the presidency could only diminish him. He had done so much for the country. Let's face it, he was the key American of his generation. I don't know that any other individual could have done what he accomplished in his first and second terms as president. The impressions with which I first undertook the arduous trust were explained on the proper occasion. In the discharge of this trust, I will only say that I have, with good intentions, contributed towards the organization and administration of the government, the best exertions of which a very fallible judgment was capable. Not unconscious in the outset of the inferiority of my qualifications, experience in my own eyes, perhaps still more in the eyes of others, has strengthened the motives to diffidence of myself. And every day the increasing weight of years admonishes me more and more. 
that the shade of retirement is as necessary to me as it will be welcome. Satisfied that if any circumstances have given peculiar value to my services, they were temporary, I have the consolation to believe that while choice and prudence invite me to quit the political scene, patriotism does not forbid it. I think there was pressure for him to serve a second term. I mean, this is a brand new constitution and a new government, so he wanted a certain amount of stability. But he was the individual the public most saw as the national symbol. And I don't think that after just four years, he would have been satisfied, nor would a lot of his countrymen have been satisfied, that four years was enough to really put the country on a solid functioning basis. But he was prevailed on by many people in his government to, to run for a second term, in part because there, was, there were huge factional disputes that had br broken out primarily between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. Most felt that Washington was needed for as long as possible to allow the institutions, the practices, the mindset of being one nation to take a firmer hold. And I think he understood that his first term would be hard to replicate, but felt it was important for the country's stability that he serve another four years and, and solidify the country's uh, traditions. That second term, I think, is what helped put the country over the top as far as its internal stability and its international recognition. By the time you get to 1796, there were a lot of people who were very upset by some of the things that had happened and some of the things that Washington had participated in. So I don't think there was the same kind of pressure for him to run for a third term. Um, I'm not at all sure that he would have won a third term if he ran. In looking forward to the moment, which is intended to terminate the career of my public life, my feelings do not permit me to suspend the deep acknowledgement of that debt of gratitude which I owe to my beloved country for the many honors it has conferred upon me, still more for the steadfast confidence with which it has supported me, and for the opportunities I have thence enjoyed of manifesting my inviolable attachment by services faithful and persevering, though in usefulness unequal to my zeal. If benefits have resulted to our country from these services, let it always be remembered to your praise, and as an instructive example in our annals, that under circumstances in which the passions agitated in every direction were liable to mislead, amidst appearances sometimes dubious, vicissitudes of fortune often discouraging, in situations in which not unfrequently want of success has countenanced the spirit of criticism, the constancy of your support was the essential prop of the efforts and a guarantee of the plans by which they were effected. Profoundly penetrated with this idea, I shall carry it with me to my grave as a strong incitement to unceasing vows that heaven may continue to you the choicest tokens of its beneficence, that your union and brotherly affection may be perpetual, that the free constitution, which is the work of your hands, may be sacredly maintained, that its administration in every department may be stamped with wisdom and virtue, that, in fine, the happiness of the people of these states, under the auspices of liberty, may be made complete, by so careful a preservation and so prudent a use of this blessing, as will acquire to them the glory of recommending it to the applause, the affection, and adoption of every nation which is yet a stranger to it. In advocating that the ideals of the federal constitution be shared with other nations didn't necessarily mean he was trying to export American constitutional forms to other countries. The founding fathers, Washington, along with Madison, Hamilton, and even Jefferson, believed that they had hit upon some universal ideas with regard to natural rights and some universal ideas with regard to governing that the rest of the world could could benefit from. I think he was much less interested in proselytizing and preaching about the virtues of the American system than making sure that the system actually worked. What he did mean was that the example of a functioning republic hopefully could be replicated, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. If he talks about sharing it with other countries, I wouldn't really say he meant that it should then 
include spreading democracy elsewhere, at least not using democracy the way we mean it today. Um, because democracy was a radical term to Washington and some of the members of his generation. What Washington is urging is for people to remember that. America is the world's best hope for a better way for societies to be organized, where the average person has real say in how they're governed. Would everything be exactly like the American Constitution? Washington was too realistic, uh, too understanding that different peoples had to develop their own, their own forms. But he had great faith in republics if people would make them work. And that meant a firm constitution that had popular support. Here, perhaps, I ought to stop. But a solicitude for your welfare, which cannot end but with my life, and the apprehension of danger natural to that solicitude, urge me on an occasion like the present to offer to your solemn contemplation and to recommend to your frequent review some sentiments, which are the result of much reflection, of no inconsiderable observation, and which appear to me all important to the permanency of your felicity as a people. These will be offered to you with the more freedom as you can only see in them the disinterested warnings of a parting friend who can possibly have no personal motive to bias his counsel. Nor can I forget, as an encouragement to it, your indulgent reception of my sentiments on a former and not dissimilar occasion. Interwoven as is the love of liberty with every ligament of your hearts, no recommendation of mine is necessary to fortify or confirm the attachment. The tone of Washington's farewell address is a bit different than his behavior, really, uh, for the previous 30 years. So he talks about being a friend in the farewell address. I don't think he means he's going to pal around and put his arm around people. I think he's trying to be a little bit more down to earth. Washington had a deep and abiding sense of his image, of his reputation. But his public persona, he felt, needed to be reserved, and he had to be very careful about what he said. And this led people some people to think of him as cold and aloof. And I think part of his reserve was probably natural. And again, part of it was to sort of almost be above other people to gain respect, because I think this is what he wanted as a person, but also as a general and then as president, he wanted respect for the office. I think Washington, near the end of his eight years, felt like he had a lot of things to say to his country, a lot of lessons to impart. Washington wanted to go on record with what he thought this new republic could do, and how to keep it safe, and how to make it grow in the future. Washington saw this as his legacy. The United States was going to be his legacy, and, and he had some clear ideas with regard to the direction and, and the decisions and the policies that the country should be implementing. I think the farewell address provided Washington with a wonderful context to say uh, much that he'd been thinking about, to sort of unburden himself, and to do it in a way in which his motives for speaking this way could not really be challenged. It was his opportunity to speak to his his fellow citizens very directly. The unity of government, which constitutes you one people, is also now dear to you. It is justly so, for it is a main pillar in the edifice of your real independence. The support of your tranquility at home, your peace abroad, of your safety, of your prosperity, of that very liberty which you so highly prize. But as it is easy to foresee that from different causes and from different quarters much pains will be taken, many artifices employed to weaken in your minds the conviction of this truth, as this is the point in your political fortress against which the batteries of internal and external enemies will be most constantly and actively, though often covertly and insidiously, directed. It is of infinite moment that you should properly estimate the immense value of your national union to your collective and individual happiness, that you should cherish a cordial, habitual, and immovable attachment to it, accustoming yourselves to think and speak of it as of the palladium of your political safety and prosperity, 
watching for its preservation with jealous anxiety, discountenancing whatever may suggest even a suspicion that it can in any event be abandoned, and indignantly frowning upon the first dawning of every attempt to alienate any portion of our country from the rest, or to enfeeble the sacred ties which now link together the various parts. The federal constitution was an experiment. Let's face it, no one knew how well it was going to work. The weaknesses in the Confederation government were apparent to even those who did not want a strong central government. Part of the problem was the Articles Confederation didn't work. It, it didn't have the kind of fundamental powers of government that were necessary for the country to run effectively. Washington was concerned about unity um, and whether the states, the, the new United States would fracture um, into several pieces. And become like Europe and would maybe three or four or five or who knows how many countries who would be constantly in competition, constantly uh, harming each other, either economically, politically, or even militarily. This is certainly what the British government leaders and the king expected uh, to happen, what they were kind of hoping to happen. And that the promise of America contained in the Declaration would never be fulfilled. Washington believes that for America to survive, for the country to endure, it needs a stronger central government, and he was committed to executing that vision. The Constitution had an opportunity to do that, but only if it could be proven in experience that the Constitution would actually work. He's aware that there's a role for the states to play, that there's a, a role for local governments to play. And he really felt that Americans had to perceive themselves as some new people, a new nation, that the United States was a country as a whole, that the federal government spoke for everyone, and that American loyalties should be seen as something that transcended the traditional state loyalties that had marked the, the colonial and even the revolutionary period. For this, you have every inducement of sympathy and interest. Citizens by birth or choice of a common country, that country has a right to concentrate your affections. The name of American, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local discriminations. With slight shades of difference, you have the same religion, manners, habits, and political principles. You have, in a common cause, fought and triumphed together. The independence and liberty you possess are the work of joint councils and joint efforts of common dangers, sufferings, and successes. But these considerations, however powerfully they address themselves to your sensibility, are greatly outweighed by those which apply more immediately to your interest. Here, every portion of our country finds the most commanding motives for carefully guarding and preserving the union of the whole. Washington wanted a new citizenship. He simply said, Americans have to see themselves as a distinct new country. For Washington, being American was very simple. To be an American, you have to want to be an American. You have to embrace the ideals it's based upon. They cannot simply see themselves as Virginians or citizens of New Jersey or New Yorkers or Carolinians or Pennsylvanians. For Washington, there's a single national interest. There's a single best course, best policy for the country to take. It's actually quite simple. Do you embrace the ideal of the declaration that all men are created equal? that people are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Americans had to consider that their history as 13 different states or 13 different colonies uh, was now transcended. Doesn't matter your religion, your color, your creed, your ethnicity, anything. It's do you embrace those ideals? The North, in an unrestrained intercourse with the South, protected by the equal laws of a common government, finds in the productions of the latter 
great additional resources of maritime and commercial enterprise and precious materials of manufacturing industry. The South, in the same intercourse, benefiting by the agency of the North, sees its agriculture grow and its commerce expand. Turning partly into its own channels, the seamen of the North, it finds its particular navigation invigorated. And while it contributes in different ways to nourish and increase the general mass of the national navigation, it looks forward to the protection of a maritime strength to which itself is unequally adapted. The East, in a like intercourse with the West, already finds, and in the progressive improvement of interior communications by land and water, will more and more find a valuable vent for the commodities which it brings from abroad or manufactures at home. The West derives from the East supplies requisite to its growth and comfort. And what is perhaps of still greater consequence, it must of necessity owe the secure enjoyment of indispensable outlets for its own productions to the weight, influence, and the future maritime strength of the Atlantic side of the Union, directed by an indissoluble community of interest as one nation. Any other tenure by which the West can hold this essential advantage, whether derived from its own separate strength or from an apostate and unnatural connection with any foreign power, must be intrinsically precarious. The Republicans were centered in the southern states and the Federalists had the bulk of their power in the northern states. They were a centrifugal force in danger of, of spinning America off in any number of different directions. He was very much aware that a lot of the political differences and the larger debate over what was the proper course with regard to economics, with regard to society and culture was regionally based. What he saw in the Constitution and in his own performance as president was an opportunity uh, to be centripetal force to pull it together. It's his attempt to reflect uh, the idea that as president, he's president of the whole country. Um, he's not just the president of Virginia. But he was again someone who had the political clout, who had the charisma, who had the identity of an American, not of a southerner. We have to keep in mind that of all Americans, he was the one who had to command America's first truly national institution. And it wasn't a government, it was an army. He saw firsthand the chaos of a weak central government. And that chaos caused people to lose their lives. And without uh, a national perspective, the Continental Army would have failed. And without the Continental Army, independence was impossible. Over the course of his lifetime, he very much evolved from being a typical Virginia planter into a first-generation American nationalist. And again, by nationalist, I mean a federalist, a unionist. While then every part of our country thus feels an immediate and particular interest in union, all the parts combined cannot fail to find in the united mass of means and efforts greater strength, greater resource, proportionably greater security from external danger a less frequent interruption of their peace by foreign nations, and what is of inestimable value, they must derive from union and exemption from those broils and wars between themselves, which so frequently afflict neighboring countries not tied together by the same government, which their own rivalships alone would be sufficient to produce, but which opposite foreign alliances, attachments, and intrigues would stimulate and embitter. Hence, likewise, they will avoid the necessity of those overgrown military establishments, which, under any form of government, are inauspicious to liberty, and which are to be regarded as particularly hostile to Republican liberty. In this sense it is, that your union ought to be considered as a main prop of your liberty, and that the love of the one ought to endear to you the preservation of the other. He was as opposed to the kind of standing army the English had, 
or the French or any of the other big European powers. That's very much consistent with the Republican belief at the time, which was that a strong standing army, a large powerful army was the single greatest threat to a Republican government. If the army responds to the leader, let's we'll say the president, rather than to those ideals, we're basically one day away from a dictatorship at any time. It's one of the reasons why the Constitution is written in such a way that you have a civilian commander in chief over the military. On the other hand, if you don't have a military strong enough to protect you, you're one day away from being taken over by someone. What he wanted was a small core of professional soldiers around whom militia could be called up in time of need. And he was not talking about militia as a rabble. I think Washington also saw enough of the European experiment to be very concerned about a large military complex in the United States. He just did not think that that was compatible with the traditions that they were trying to establish. So he was walking a fine line between American mistrust of standing armies and what he understood were the need for regular troops in order for America to have any military policy at all. These considerations speak a persuasive language to every reflecting and virtuous mind and exhibit the continuance of the Union as a primary object of patriotic desire. Is there a doubt whether a common government can embrace so large a sphere? Let experience solve it. To listen to mere speculation in such a case were criminal. We are authorized to hope that a proper organization of the whole, with the auxiliary agency of governments for the respective subdivisions, will afford a happy issue to the experiment. Tis well worth a fair and full experiment. Benjamin Franklin's comment to an individual uh, after the Constitutional Convention when she asked, what kind of a new government do we have? And he said, uh, you have a republic if you can keep it. It was an experiment and Washington knew it. He was there in all the seminal events of the first part of our country's formation. And he realized how ad hoc it was, how, how tenuous the accomplishments were, how easily things could have been different. The ability of uh, 13 separate states to give up some of their sovereignty, an extraordinary undertaking, really, uh, just to get them to do that, uh, and against a lot of opposition. But to come together, uh, sit down, hammer out a document that allowed a functional government to actually get up and running, it was quite an accomplishment. One of the revolutionary pieces was this structure of government, government of, by, and for the people that gets enshrined in the Constitution. And it's controversial, and it's words on a piece of paper that have to get worked out. I think modern politicians, some of them, some modern judges, see this as um, scripture written in stone and so on. And I don't think the authors of, of the Constitution really saw it that way. The ability to interpret the Constitution through legislation to interpret it through court decisions, to interpret it through amendment. And uh, there is the entire business of what's allowable under executive order. But the experiment continues, and I think that is the strength of the Constitution. We can still experiment. With such powerful and obvious motives to union affecting all parts of our country, while experience shall not have demonstrated its impracticability, there will always be reason to distrust the patriotism of those who in any quarter may endeavor to weaken its bands. In contemplating the causes which may disturb our union, it occurs as matter of serious concern that any ground should have been furnished for characterizing parties by geographical discriminations, northern and southern, Atlantic and western, whence designing men may endeavor to excite a belief that there is a real difference of local interests and views. The largest threat to America was essentially dividing into two factions. And maybe in today's language, too, we might say class differences, farmers versus merchants, as well as North and South. Was there a threat from foreign governments? Sure. The British were a threat in Canada. France was a threat. Indian nations were a threat. 
but none of those countries really had the wherewithal to subjugate America. There was a much greater chance that the country would fall apart over slavery, economic issues, how we deal with westward expansion, then is France going to invade us? One of the expedients of party to acquire influence within particular districts is to misrepresent the opinions and aims of other districts. You cannot shield yourselves too much against the jealousies and heart burnings which spring from these misrepresentations. They tend to render alien to each other those who ought to be bound together by fraternal affection. The inhabitants of our Western country have lately had a useful lesson on this head. They have seen in the negotiation by the executive and in the unanimous ratification by the Senate of the treaty with Spain and in the universal satisfaction at that event throughout the United States, a decisive proof how unfounded were the suspicions propagated among them of a policy in the general government and in the Atlantic states unfriendly to their interests in regard to the Mississippi. They have been witnesses to the formation of two treaties, that with Great Britain and that with Spain, which secure to them everything they could desire in respect to our foreign relations towards confirming their prosperity. Will it not be their wisdom to rely for the preservation of these advantages on the union by which they were procured? Will they not henceforth be deaf to those advisers, if such there are, who would sever them from their brethren and connect them with aliens? The Jay Treaty and the Pinckney Treaty made the United States more secure in what, frankly, in many respects, was a dangerous international world. Because he firmly believes that they helped keep the United States out of a war that was not going to end well for them, no matter what. Both of those treaties gave America what they needed with regard to some stability and certainty with regard to borders, with regard to trade practices and the like. And Washington felt that that was a critical thing for the growth of the nation's security and for the maturity of the republic as a nation among nations. Washington probably was ahead of his contemporaries in terms of this debate, and whereas the treaty might have made some concessions to Great Britain that uh, were not real easy for his contemporaries to understand, that Washington had a broader, long-term perspective. These were international treaties with major European powers that the United States, in just making these treaties, demonstrated that it was a player. To the efficacy and permanency of your union, a government for the whole is indispensable. No alliances, however strict between the parts, can be an adequate substitute. They must inevitably experience the infractions and interruptions which all alliances in all times have experienced. Sensible of this momentous truth, you have improved upon your first essay by the adoption of a constitution of government, better calculated than your former for an intimate union and for the efficacious management of your common concerns. This government, the offspring of our own choice, uninfluenced and unawed, adopted upon full investigation and mature deliberation, completely free in its principles, in the distribution of its powers, uniting security with energy, and containing within itself a provision for its own amendment, has a just claim to your confidence and your support. Respect for its authority, compliance with its laws, acquiescence in its measures are duties enjoined by the fundamental maxims of true liberty. The basis of our political systems is the right of the people to make and to alter their constitutions of government. But the constitution which at any time exists, till changed by an explicit and authentic act of the whole people, is sacredly obligatory upon all. The very idea of the power and the right of the people to establish government presupposes the duty of every individual to obey the established government.
If anything, I think Washington had maybe a greater reverence for the Constitution than many of our contemporaries, in part because he was there at ground zero as it was being assembled and, and understood the careful trade-offs that occurred, the long debates on just the structure of government that should be assembled. This was a compact of citizens. It was uh, the work of men who had thought long and hard about what a polity could be. I think he intuitively knew that the Constitution needed to be treated with reverence and respect, just as you would theological text. Washington was a deist, and I bring that up in the context of the Constitution because he believed that there was a great disposer of, of of world events, but was he committed to any particular doctrine? No, he was not. People needed to not only follow the Constitution and the laws that came from it, but they needed to believe in it. He saw the Constitution as the workings of rational human beings, and if uh, Providence uh, had a hand in making people rational, I think he would have agreed to it, but Secular religion, no. All obstructions to the execution of the laws, all combinations and associations, under whatever plausible character, with the real design to direct, control, counteract, or awe the regular deliberation and action of the constituted authorities, are destructive of this fundamental principle and of fatal tendency. They serve to organize faction, to give it an artificial and extraordinary force, to put in the place of the delegated will of the nation, the will of a party, often a small but artful and enterprising minority of the community, and according to the alternate triumphs of different parties, to make the public administration the mirror of the ill-concerted and incongruous projects of faction, rather than the organ of consistent and wholesome plans digested by common councils and modified by mutual interests. However combinations or associations of the above description may now and then answer popular ends, they are likely, in the course of time and things, to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. Washington did not believe that political parties were healthy for the republic. He certainly thought both of them were very serious threats to the country and felt that both threatened to undermine the American experiment. He believed that rational individuals uh, working together, probably in good faith, could work through political difficulties, uh, compromise, if you will. The partisan politics broke down along, in a sense as they still do today, over those who believe in a greater, more powerful central government, and those who believe that the less government, the better, and who see government as the problem, not the solution. Formal political parties, uh, while at the end of his life, he certainly understood that they were a reality, whether he liked it or not, but did he fear that they were a threat to the Republic, he had real reservations. Towards the preservation of your government and the permanency of your present happy state, it is requisite not only that you steadily discountenance irregular oppositions to its acknowledged authority, but also that you resist with care the spirit of innovation upon its principles, however specious the pretexts. One method of assault may be to effect, in the forms of the Constitution, alterations which will impair the energy of the system 
and thus to undermine what cannot be directly overthrown. In all the changes to which you may be invited, remember that time and habit are at least as necessary to fix the true character of governments as of other human institutions, that experience is the surest standard by which to test the real tendency of the existing constitution of a country, that facility in changes upon the credit of mere hypotheses and opinion exposes to perpetual change from the endless variety of hypotheses and opinion. And remember especially that for the efficient management of your common interests in a country so extensive as ours, a government of as much vigor as is consistent with the perfect security of liberty is indispensable. Liberty itself will find in such a government, with powers properly distributed and adjusted, its surest guardian. It is indeed little else than a name where the government is too feeble to withstand the enterprises of faction, to confine each member of the society within the limits prescribed by the laws, and to maintain all in the secure and tranquil enjoyment of the rights of person and property. I believe that Washington thinks the amending process in the Constitution is much more of a way to protect liberty. So Washington understood that the power of the Constitution uh, lay at least partially in the ability of citizens to alter it when occasion demanded. Paramount in the minds of Washington and of that revolutionary generation because of their own experiences, because of the Enlightenment theories and philosophies of the time, was trying to ensure individual rights and privileges. Now, Washington did not believe that history stood still. He knew that future generations would call on Americans to face new, new circumstances, and the Constitution had to be flexible enough to allow the new nation to do that. I think Washington was of the view that the, the American Constitution was a carefully assembled uh, political structure uh, that should be respected, should be adhered to, and that it should be changed very reluctantly, and certainly should not be changed just to reflect the passing whims of the moment. I have already intimated to you the danger of parties in the state, with particular reference to the founding of them on geographical discriminations. Let me now take a more comprehensive view and warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party generally. This spirit, unfortunately, is inseparable from our nature, having its root in the strongest passions of the human mind. It exists under different shapes in all governments, more or less stifled, controlled, or repressed. But in those of the popular form, it is seen in its greatest rankness and is truly their worst enemy. Washington believed, and he certainly tried to govern with the sense that there was one right path for America, and yes, that the president should be beyond party. His view was that it would lead to a sort of reflexive uh, fighting and combat and moving off into dueling corners. He wouldn't have wanted to see himself as, a, as associated or affiliated with the party, but in his belief and, and in his action, he is very much along the same mindsets of the Federalists. George Washington was his own man. And when he went on record as expressing his doubts about the wisdom of political parties, that was George Washington talking, not Thomas Jefferson, not Alexander Hamilton. Washington's concern was for the success of the new republic under its constitutional form of government. And I think that while political parties have at times, through much of our history, have played a constructive role in, in channeling different views and providing a, a forum for political argument, I think that in some cases in, its mod, in their modern iteration, Political parties have become the sort of instruments that Washington was afraid they would become, which are just uh, sort of inclusive, uh, exclusionary groups focused on self-preservation than, than trying to advance the nation's longer-term interests. 
The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetrated the most horrid enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. But this leads at length to a more formal and permanent despotism. The disorders and miseries which result gradually incline the minds of men to seek security and repose in the absolute power of an individual, and sooner or later the chief of some prevailing faction more able or more fortunate than his competitors turns this disposition to the purposes of his own elevation on the ruins of public liberty. Without looking forward to an extremity of this kind, which nevertheless ought not to be entirely out of sight, the common and continual mischiefs of the spirit of party are sufficient to make it the interest and the duty of a wise people to discourage and restrain it. I think Washington's admonishments about the danger of the two-party system are, are particularly relevant today, especially when we see how factionalized and how tribalized the Republicans and the Democrats have been. His whole generation did not expect this to happen originally. I think they didn't approve. They were hoping that there would be an aura of cooperation and agreement. They thought factions were bad. Political parties, I suspect, worse than factions. Parties have played a constructive role at various points in American history. But I think in their current form, they uh, sort of reinforce some of Washington's significant concerns that were expressed in the 18th century. There's plenty of social scientists, um, observers, political commentators that are talking about how polarized the country has become and how the parties are increasingly led and run by uh, the more extreme wings of those political theories. I think what Washington would say if say, for example, he was addressing Congress today, you are allowing petty partisan politics and interests keep you from doing the work of the people. You are essentially trampling over 240 years of tradition and, by the way, success. I think that Washington would have loved uh, for the president, uh, for the chief executive, to be above politics uh, and partisanship. I'm not sure he always was himself. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, which find a facilitated access to the government itself through the channels of party passions. Thus the policy and the will of one country are subjected to the policy and will of another. Another. There is an opinion that parties in free countries are useful checks upon the administration of the government and serve to keep alive the spirit of liberty. This, within certain limits, is probably true. And in governments of a monarchical caste, patriotism may look with indulgence, if not with favor, upon the spirit of party. But in those of the popular character, in governments purely elective, it is a spirit not to be encouraged. From their natural tendency, it is certain there will always be enough of that spirit for every salutary purpose. And there being constant danger of excess, the effort ought to be, by force of public opinion, to mitigate and assuage it. A fire not to be quenched, it demands a uniform vigilance to prevent its bursting into a flame, lest instead of warming, it should consume. I think Washington deeply respected what had happened, but also was fully aware of how fragile the accomplishments were. Washington wants to appeal to this sense of national unity that comes out of the war for independence, that comes out of the Constitution, even if it's mythical to a certain degree. Historians have estimated maybe about 50, 51 percent of the people approved of the Constitution. I think we forget how close 
uh, that it all was. He recognized that national unity, both in terms of political institutions, but in terms of the population, was going to be so important to keeping the country together and to maintaining that strong political stability. So I think he certainly saw unity as important. It's particularly important in 1796 because political parties have just started to raise their head and he sees this as disunity. He understood that he was the glue holding things together but he looked forward to a time when the Republic would be a success on its own two feet, when it didn't need an iconic figure at the helm, when the Constitution itself would provide the mechanism that would make sure that the Republic could reach into the future successfully. It is important, likewise, that the habits of thinking in a free country should inspire caution in those entrusted with its administration to confine themselves within their respective constitutional spheres, avoiding in the exercise of the powers of one department to encroach upon another. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments in one, and thus to create whatever the form of government, a real despotism. A just estimate of that love of power and proneness to abuse it, which predominates in the human heart, is sufficient to satisfy us of the truth of this position. The necessity of reciprocal checks in the exercise of political power by dividing and distributing it into different depositories and constituting each the guardian of the public wheel against invasions by the others has been evinced by experiments ancient and modern, some of them in our country and under our own eyes. To preserve them must be as necessary as to institute them. If, in the opinion of the people, the distribution or modification of the constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, let it be corrected by an amendment in the way which the Constitution designates. But let there be no change by usurpation, for though this, in one instance, may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. The precedent must always greatly overbalance in permanent evil any partial or transient benefit which the use can at any time yield. Historians have noted that Washington uh, probably solidified in his place in world history in his two elemental acts of relinquishing power. First, military power after the Revolutionary War, and then stepping down voluntarily from the presidency after his two terms. Washington shows respect for the separation of branches of the federal government because he believed that the concentration of power into too few hands or into certainly into any one hand was the single most dangerous force with regard to destabilizing the country. Washington showed a keen appreciation of the importance of, of not having a government dominated by one person. This goes back to Washington's belief that public service, well performed, was its own reward, that it was an obligation and duty of a virtuous citizen in a republic to serve the republic uh, not in hope for material or personal gain, but to serve as an end in itself. Washington was, was treading on ground that no one else had treaded on before, and through intuition, incredible military experience, political experience, a shrewd understanding of, of human nature, effectively created the presidency. I mean, no one else has done that. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism, who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. The mere politician, equally with a pious man, ought to respect and to cherish them. A volume could not trace all their connections with private and public felicity. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths? 
which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Tis substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government. The rule indeed extends with more or less force to every species of free government. Who that is a sincere friend to it can look with indifference upon attempts to shake the foundation of the fabric. Washington does talk a great bit about religion and morality, but he never mentions slavery which today some people see as hypocrisy. Looking at it from Washington's point of view, it makes perfect sense. What is he going to say? Washington was always uncomfortable with his sort of exalted view of human nature, his broader views of the human condition, and his role as a slave owner. I don't know if you can say that Washington is ashamed that his private income is based on slavery. Again, it's what he knew, but he was uncomfortable with it. Virginians in the 1780s and 1790s, you know, these were smart men. These were educated men. Even if there's some kind of uh, internal inconsistency or cognitive dissonance with regard to all men are created equal and, oh, by the way, all of our money comes from slaveholding. I think a lot of historians have tried to grapple with how the founders, including Washington, could have created such a uh, solid, creative, humane political system but also had such a blind eye for slavery. The Bible is used and invoked as a defense of slavery and of, and of slaveholding. So Southerners, slaveholders like Washington, like Jefferson, like Madison wouldn't have seen any incongruity being slaveholders on the one hand and seeing themselves as religious and, and moral people on the other. The entire issue of slavery in the, in the uh, Constitution was there from the get-go. It was part of the great compromise that uh, allowed the country to come together. It was a flaw in the Constitution, seen by many at the, same, at the time, uh, but accepted by most as the lesser of evils to get the Republic off the ground. Promote then, as an object of primary importance, institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge. In proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion, it is essential that public opinion should be enlightened. As a very important source of strength and security, cherish public credit. One method of preserving it is to use it as sparingly as possible, avoiding occasions of expense by cultivating peace, but remembering also that timely disbursements to prepare for danger frequently prevent much greater disbursements to repel it, avoiding likewise the accumulation of debt not only by shunning occasions of expense, but by vigorous exertions in time of peace to discharge the debts which unavoidable wars may have occasioned, not ungenerously throwing upon posterity the burden which we ourselves ought to bear. The execution of these maxims belongs to your representatives, but it is necessary that public opinion should cooperate. To facilitate to them the performance of their duty, it is essential that you should practically bear in mind that towards the payment of debts there must be revenue, that to have revenue there must be taxes, that no taxes can be devised which are not more or less inconvenient and unpleasant, that the intrinsic embarrassment inseparable from the selection of the proper objects, which is always a choice of difficulties, ought to be a decisive motive for a candid construction of the conduct of the government in making it, and for a spirit of acquiescence in the measures for obtaining revenue which the public exigencies may at any time dictate. When we talk about the economy of the new republic, 
we have to put Alexander Hamilton front and center. Hamilton was a very persuasive man, thought hard and deeply on economic issues, was candidly much more interested in those than was Washington. Jefferson believes in this yeoman republic, right? This nation of small farmers, of limited government, where you didn't really need that much government because people had their independence through their economic self-sufficiency. Washington saw agriculture in business terms as well. But Washington did not understand the complicated mechanisms of putting a financial system together. Hamilton's creation of an extraordinarily powerful department at Treasury and his creation of, of modern economic policies with trade and with credit markets and dealing with debt was something that influenced Washington tremendously. This was new, this was novel. They looked at debt as something that was really bad. Um, it, it, you don't need a bank because you don't need to borrow because that's in the long run dangerous, which they had learned uh, the hard way that it really was dangerous. They got into trouble by borrowing. But he had faith in what Hamilton was doing, particularly as Hamilton was able to fund the national debt, to assume the, uh, the war-related burdens of the uh, state governments, to take on a national economy and actually make it work. And even Jefferson, when he becomes president, is forced to admit that that kind of more powerful government and tax policy, economic policy, is, is necessary for the country to endure. Washington was astute enough as a businessman, astute enough as a financial observer to know a winner when he had one. And he, he had a winner in Hamilton and he knew it. Observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. Religion and morality enjoin this conduct. And can it be that good policy does not equally enjoin it? It will be worthy of a free, enlightened, and at no distant period, a great nation to give to mankind the magnanimous and too novel example of a people always guided by an exalted justice and benevolence. Who can doubt that in the course of time and things, the fruits of such a plan would richly repay any temporary advantages which might be lost by a steady adherence to it? Can it be that providence has not connected the permanent felicity of a nation with its virtue? The experiment, at least, is recommended by every sentiment which ennobles human nature. Alas, is it rendered impossible by its vices? Washington wanted to be on good terms with all nations, and it was the sentiment of a fellow who was fairly sophisticated in looking at the rest of the world. It might sound naive, but it actually makes sense to be friend to all, enemy to none. When he wanted to be on good terms with all nations, it didn't mean he thought that they always would be. Washington had a pretty deep understanding of the world. He had dealt with British military officers, French military officers. And so I think his understanding of the perils of being too deeply committed to one country versus another was rooted in some real world experience. Washington certainly recognized that the country from a political standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a military standpoint, wasn't in position to get embroiled in a war either at home or certainly not overseas. The countries of Europe in particular were unsentimental countries and that they uh, would side with the United States when it was to their advantage and would oppose it when it was not. Washington really wanted at least 20 years of international peace so that the United States could get its footing in the world, uh, could develop its own resources so that it could defend itself. In the execution of such a plan, nothing is more essential than that permanent, inveterate antipathies against particular nations and passionate attachments for others should be excluded, and that in place of them, just and amicable feelings towards all should be cultivated. The nation which indulges towards another an habitual hatred or an habitual fondness 
is in some degree a slave. It is a slave to its animosity or to its affection, either of which is sufficient to lead it astray from its duty and its interest. Antipathy in one nation against another disposes each more readily to offer insult and injury, to lay hold of slight causes of umbrage, and to be haughty and intractable when accidental or trifling occasions of dispute occur. Hence frequent collisions, obstinate, envenomed, and bloody contests. The nation, prompted by ill will and resentment, sometimes impels to war the government, contrary to the best calculations of policy. The government sometimes participates in the national propensity and adopts through passion what reason would reject. At other times it makes the animosity of the nation subservient to projects of hostility instigated by pride, ambition, and other sinister and pernicious motives. The peace often, sometimes perhaps the liberty, of nations has been the victim. Washington's very strong reaction to the activities of Citizen Genet, the French ambassador, mucking around in America, not only hiring soldiers and outfitting privateers, but actually getting involved in American politics, is completely natural that he would, he would be so upset by it. Washington understood that Genet was a problem because there were plenty of Americans with a great deal of sympathy for the French Revolution uh, because of the critical role the French had played during the American Revolution. Washington had no idea if Genet was setting a precedent where countries from all over the world would be sending agents to mess around with our elections and our politics. If Genet succeeded, of course there would be others that would come and try and do the same thing. They could be French, they could be English even, they could be Spanish citizens who could come and start buying and taking up American ships um, and putting crews on them and sending them off to fight their enemies. So the United States really then just becomes a pawn. It has the very real possibility of getting America embroiled in a war with a country at a time that they don't want wars. And then at the same time, it threatens the internal unity and the internal cohesion of the United States. In Genet's case, essentially, he gave the man enough time to hang himself. Genet overplayed his hand in what became a series of incidents too lengthy to go into here, that seemed in the end to be insulting personally to George Washington, not just as president, but as the icon of the American Revolution. It also helped that Genet's faction in France fell out of power, and Genet dared not go back to France because he'd probably be facing the guillotine. So likewise, a passionate attachment of one nation for another produces a variety of evils. Sympathy for the favorite nation, facilitating the illusion of an imaginary common interest in cases where no real common interest exists, and infusing into one the enmities of the other, betrays the former into a participation in the quarrels and war wars of the latter, without adequate inducement or justification. It leads also to concessions to the favorite nation of privileges denied to others, which is apt doubly to injure the nation making the concessions, by unnecessarily parting with what ought to have been retained, and by exciting jealousy, ill will, and a disposition to retaliate in the parties from whom equal privileges are withheld and it gives to ambitious, corrupted, or deluded citizens who devote themselves to the favorite nation facility to betray or sacrifice the interests of their own country without odium, sometimes even with popularity, gilding with the appearances of a virtuous sense of obligation, a commendable deference for public opinion, or a laudable zeal for public good, the base or foolish compliances of ambition, corruption, or infatuation. I think it's important to note that whatever Washington said should not be interpreted to mean that Washington was against alliances with other nations. Any president had to be willing to look at foreign relations on a case-by-case -case basis. If you become a tight military ally with a foreign nation, you're going to lead to division within the American body politic. 
I think Washington thought neutrality was the, the best practical strategy to buy the U.S., the infant country, a period of time to strengthen its own institutions. Washington also believed that the United States ought to be focusing on its own sphere, the Western Hemisphere, that as the United States developed as a power unto itself, it would have its own sphere of influence. So he did not want to be a satellite in somebody else's sphere. The disputes between the European countries, particularly Britain and France, were going to go on for long periods of time, didn't involve core U.S. interests. And so there was just little to be gained by getting drawn into these battles. By calling for America to remain neutral was simply to avoid those kinds of entanglements that were going to get you drawn into a war, and a war that even if it was being fought by European powers, could have an American theater. And Washington knew that nations generally seek to act in their own self-interest, and that we should do the same. We should not ally ourselves with another nation for philosophical reasons or sentimental, romantic reasons. He did not like alliances that bound America beyond the term in which an alliance could be useful to the American national interest. But he never uh, remotely believed that America should be an isolationist nation. As avenues to foreign influence in innumerable ways, such attachments are particularly alarming to the truly enlightened and independent patriot. How many opportunities do they afford to tamper with domestic factions, to practice the arts of seduction, to mislead public opinion, to influence or awe the public councils? Such an attachment of a small or weak towards a great and powerful nation do dooms the former to be the satellite of the latter. Against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, I conjure you to believe me, fellow citizens, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake, since history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of republican government. But that jealousy to be useful must be impartial, else it becomes the instrument of the very influence to be avoided, instead of a defense against it. Excessive partiality for one foreign nation and excessive dislike of another cause those whom they actuate to see danger only on one side and serve to veil and even second the arts of influence on the other. Real patriots who may resist the intrigues of the favorite are liable to become suspected and odious, while its tools and dupes usurp the applause and confidence of the people to surrender their interests. The great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible. So far as we have already formed engagements, let them be fulfilled with perfect good faith. Here, let us stop. Europe has a set of primary interests, which to us have none or very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it must be unwise in us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in the ordinary vicissitudes of her politics, or the ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or enmities. He's confident that America will continue to expand westward. I don't really know if he expected us to go all the way to the Pacific Ocean, but I'm sure he envisioned us going at least to the Mississippi River. Washington was among the earliest spectators in the Ohio Territory, so he's already looking beyond the Appalachian Mountains in the 1760s. Europe wasn't just over there. Europe was also over here, and we were no longer just to the crest of the Appalachians. We were all the way out to the Mississippi, up to the Great Lakes, pressing toward the Gulf. We didn't have Florida yet, but we were pressing toward the Gulf. America was already bigger than all these European nations anyway, and we were only gonna get bigger and more powerful through natural population increase and immigration. 
Our detached and distant situation invites and enables us to pursue a different course. If we remain one people under an efficient government, the period is not far off when we may defy material injury from external annoyance, when we may take such an attitude as will cause the neutrality we may at any time resolve upon to be scrupulously respected, when belligerent nations under the impossibility of making acquisitions upon us will not lightly hazard the giving us provocation, when we may choose peace or war as our interest, guided by justice, shall counsel. Why forego the advantages of so peculiar a situation? Why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Why, by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice. Tis our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world, so far I mean as we are now at liberty to do it. For let me not be understood as capable of patronizing infidelity to existing engagements. I hold the maxim no less applicable to public than to private affairs, that honesty is always the best policy. I repeat it, therefore, let those engagements be observed in their genuine sense. But in my opinion, it is unnecessary and would be unwise to extend them, taking care always to keep ourselves by suitable establishments on a respectably defensive posture, we may safely trust to temporary alliances for extraordinary emergencies. What happens in Europe affects us profoundly now, much differently than it did 200 years ago, and it can affect us immediately. One of the hardest things to, to kind of deconstruct or to, to, to speculate about is how George Washington would would view the modern world and particularly review the, the whole system of alliances that were developed in the aftermath of World War II. What I think does ring true from Washington's perspective is that alliances that do not serve the national interest are unacceptable or unpalatable uh, and, and just contrary to what America needs. Washington would have appreciated the importance of alliances like NATO or economic relationships like NAFTA. I think he would be concerned about retaining American sovereignty, but I think he would also see these arrangements as something that could be for the broader national good. If it could be explained that uh, diplomatic requirements, that America's economic and military position in the world requires something like NATO, uh, it would not be seen as an unnecessary entangling alliance or permanent alliance. Harmony, liberal intercourse with all nations are recommended by policy, humanity, and interest. But even our commercial policy should hold an equal and impartial hand, neither seeking nor granting exclusive favors or preferences, consulting the natural course of things, diffusing and diversifying by gentle means the streams of commerce, but forcing nothing, establishing with powers so disposed, in order to give to trade a stable course, to define the rights of our merchants, and to enable the government to support them, conventional rules of intercourse, the best that present circumstances and mutual opinion will permit, but temporary and liable to be from time to time abandoned or varied, as experience and circumstances shall dictate, constantly keeping in view that tis folly in one nation to look for disinterested favors from another, that it must pay with a portion of its independence for whatever it may accept under that character, that by such acceptance it may place itself in the condition of having given equivalence for nominal favors, and yet of being reproached with ingratitude for not giving Giving more. There can be no greater error than to expect or calculate upon real favors from nation to nation. Tis an illusion which experience must cure, which a just pride ought to discard. Washington's views on international trade 
once again display his practical experience. When they were part of the British colonies, the trade was very narrowly restricted by the Navigation Acts. Uh, they could only ship certain kinds of goods. He had been the victim in his mind, and, and I would have to agree, of the mercantile system. He could only sell to England. He could really only buy from England. He felt he got bad prices selling and bad prices buying and shoddy, oftentimes shoddy merchandise. One of the things that the British do um, after the revolution is say, okay, so now you're free, you're not part of the British Empire anymore, so you can't trade with the British Caribbean islands because you're now out of the empire. You sort of, you got what you wanted. America was not allowed to build factories and compete with England on many of these aspects of the economy. So certainly one of the things the Americans wanted after the revolution was to be able to trade with whatever other countries they wanted to. But I do think that his, his economic policies were largely driven by his um, appreciation for the broader framework that Alexander Hamilton presented to him and persuaded him would have long-term economic benefits for the U.S. This was terribly important, um, especially for southern planters like Washington, who might have wheat that he wants to sell, um, particularly in the Caribbean, which is where they had done a lot of trade. So yeah, he wanted free trade. This is not just a Hamilton thing. Uh, they did want free trade. In offering to you, my countrymen, these counsels of an old and affectionate friend, I dare not hope they will make the strong and lasting impression I could wish, that they will control the usual current of the passions, or prevent our nation from running the course which has hitherto marked the destiny of nations. But if I may even flatter myself that they may be productive of some partial benefit, some occasional good, that they may now and then recur to moderate the fury of party spirit, to warn against the mischiefs of foreign intrigue, to guard against the impostures of pretended patriotism. This hope will be a full recompense for the solicitude for your welfare by which they have been dictated. How far in the discharge of my official duties I have been guided by the principles which have been delineated, the public records and other evidences of my conduct must witness to you and to the world. To myself, the assurance of my own conscience is that I have at least believed myself to be guided by them. In relation to the still subsisting war in Europe, my proclamation of the 22nd of April 1793 is the index to my plan, sanctioned by your approving voice and by that of your representatives in both houses of Congress. The spirit of that measure has continually governed me uninfluenced by any attempts to deter or divert me from it. After deliberate examination, with the aid of the best lights I could obtain, I was well satisfied that our country, under all the circumstances of the case, had a right to take and was bound in duty and interest to take a neutral position. Having taken it, I determined, as far as should depend upon me, to maintain it with moderation, perseverance, and firmness. The considerations which respect the right to hold this conduct, it is not necessary on this occasion to detail. I will only observe that according to my understanding of the matter, that right, so far from being denied by any of the belligerent powers, has been virtually admitted by all. The duty of holding a neutral conduct may be inferred, without anything more, from the obligation which justice and humanity impose on every nation, in cases in which it is free to act, to maintain inviolate the relations of peace and amity towards other nations. The inducements of interest for observing that conduct will best be referred to your own reflections and experience. With me, a predominant motive has been to endeavor to gain time to our country to settle and mature its yet recent institutions, and to progress without interruption to that degree of strength and consistency which is necessary to give it, humanly speaking, the command of its own fortunes. Though in reviewing the incidents of my administration, 
I am unconscious of intentional error. I am nevertheless too sensible of my defects not to think it probable that I may have committed many errors. Whatever they may be, I fervently beseech the Almighty to avert or mitigate the evils to which they may tend. I shall also carry with me the hope that my country will never cease to view them with indulgence, and that after 45 years of my life dedicated to its service with an upright zeal, the faults of incompetent abilities will be consigned to oblivion, as myself must soon be to the mansions of rest. Washington's presidency was successful. He had successfully navigated through some tricky foreign policy challenges. He had managed to begin to create a, a stronger national economy. I think he was proud of what he was able to accomplish during his eight years. And I think he felt comfortable in leaving the presidency behind. And I think he was comfortable with the legacy that he had created in, in building the presidency. There were rough spots, yes. Uh, there are always rough spots, but I think it's Washington's uh, ability to be realistic about what was possible and realistic about the steps he took to confront what was possible and over overcome some of the things that were extremely difficult. He worked very hard to gain prestige for the office, for himself, but also really for the office um, and for the new country. I think he felt like, by and large, he had accomplished everything he wanted. And the main thing was the government was up, it was running, it seemed to enjoy solid support, and the peaceful transfer of power after a free and open election. Relying on its kindness in this as in other things, and actuated by that fervent love towards it, which is so natural to a man, who views in it the native soil of himself and his progenitors for several generations. I anticipate with pleasing expectation that retreat in which I promise myself to realize, without alloy, the sweet enjoyment of partaking in the midst of my fellow citizens, the benign influence of good laws under a free government, the ever favorite object of my heart, and the happy reward, as I trust, of our mutual cares, labors, and dangers. George Washington's final day in office was March 4th, 1797. He was succeeded by John Adams, thus beginning the American tradition of the peaceful transfer of presidential power. Washington retired to his beloved Mount Vernon, returning to a military command only when the possibility of a war with France arose. After spending several hours one day inspecting his plantation on horseback, he developed a throat infection which led to his death two days later on December 14, 1799. In a eulogy delivered by Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee, Washington was described as first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. I don't think there really is quite anyone else that I could think of who had the same kind of a national reputation and name recognition to be elected as the first president. Washington was part of a, an amazing constellation of political stars. Uh, when you look back at just the enormous talent of a Washington, a Jefferson, a Hamilton, a Madison, a John Adams, it's breathtaking. Uh, all of these people were world-class statesmen. But I think you could argue that, that Washington was, you know, the brightest star. He was the most commanding presence. He also had this very singular, peculiar temperament, which I think made him unique, has made him unique in American history and has probably made him unique in world history with regard to someone who could have had any power he wanted, someone who could have exercised power to as great a degree as he wanted and he simply didn't want to. It's the kind of thing that almost makes you believe in providence. When you think about how many times in his life he narrowly missed death. But w whether it was fate or luck or divine providence, humanity was very fortunate that George Washington came along when he did. Who else was there with a national reputation who could have commanded that army and then have stepped in 
to become the president of a republic that no one knew whether or not it would work. He provided the stability, the national recognition, the international prestige to make it work. There was simply no other individual who could have done that. George Washington had to be George Washington. There was nobody else. In 1896, the United States Senate, after having informally done so several times earlier that century, established the annual tradition of having one of its members give an annual recitation of the farewell address on or around the anniversary of Washington's birthday, February 22nd. In 1956, then-Senator Hubert Humphrey had the honor of reading the document to his colleagues, writing afterwards that every American should study this memorable message. It gives one a renewed sense of pride in our republic. It arouses those wholesome and creative emotions of patriotism and love of country. The message is as immortal and enduring as the life and deeds of our first president.